Okay, we're back. We're live with Think Tech Asia here on a given Tuesday, and we have the honor of talking again to our old friend Michael Davis, Professor Michael Davis, Professor of International Law at the University of Hong Kong. He joins us by Skype. Thanks for being around, Michael. Oh, you're welcome. Nice to be back on uh, Think Tech. Good. You know, I mean, we had, we've had some extraordinary news in the International Law Department, um, namely uh, what the, the court in The Hague did the tribunal in The Hague did on the claims asserted by the Philippine government and others uh, over China's action in the South China Seas, uh, specifically um, on Scarborough Island and uh, uh, other areas in that neighborhood. You wrote an article for Insight called Damage Control. So we're going to call this show Damage Control in the South China Sea. What do you think? Yeah, this uh, article was in the South China Morning Post. Yeah, the Insight is just a section. Ah. Yeah. Right, and uh, yeah, it's been a big problem. There's, there's a need for damage control. <laughs> well, yeah, so, uh, you, and you mentioned, and this, I'd like to cover this with you if we can in our half hour. Uh, uh, you mentioned that um, there are 10 points worthy of consideration, and they're all, you know, beyond the ordinary press, I must say. This has not been covered in the ordinary press, and we ought to, we ought to cover it today. Um, you know, uh, one, for example, and I'll go down the list with you, you talked about the UN Convention and exactly what it provides and the fact that China is a member. What's the story on that? Yes, I mean, China, of course, you know, a couple, few decades ago was trying to come out of its cultural revolution, trying to become a sort of normal country. Uh, and, and among many things uh, it wanted to do was to sign on to international treaties and be a part of the international community and the UN Convention on Law of the Sea is one of those. Should note, the U.S. is not a member of that. It's, this uh, treaty has been stuck in the U.S. Congress now for decades because, uh, I, I have to say, Republicans in Congress have, are reluctant to sign on to multilateral treaties. Uh, in spite of that, the U.S. claims that it adheres to the treaty more or less. It just, as a matter of uh, customary law, I suppose, not, not even customary law, just that it, it's claiming to adhere. So China is a member, and all these uh, countries uh, along, uh, uh, you know, the South China Sea, likewise, are members. The Philippines, who brought this case, is a member. So, so they're basically an effort here to enforce a treaty. Now, why would China join such a treaty? Well, one of the things about this treaty we, we call UNCLOS, or the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, is that it extended, in the old days, there used to be three-mile territorial seas along countries, uh, and then there were some countries extending it to 12. UNCLOS makes it 12. And then it has these exclusive economic zones that go out 200 nautical miles and gives the countries, uh, the adjoining countries, control over all the resources in the area, uh, both uh, under the continental shelf and uh, in the sea, in the water column. So all of that would be very attractive to China uh, as it was emerging from its uh, dark days. Now, interesting that they would join the convention, that the U.S. would not join the convention, and now they have essentially abrogated. But one, before we move on to point two, uh, which is along those same lines, uh, doesn't it undermine our moral authority, our moral suasion here, uh, to be um, complaining about what China does when we ourselves are not a member of the convention? Yeah, this has been brought up a lot, a sort of a hip hypocrisy sort of argument I think this argument gets you only so far at the end of the day. I mean, China basically has to have relations with its neighbors uh, and claiming all of the sea, South China Sea, uh, along their coast uh, doesn't really improve those relations. So I think China has to look at this on its own. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has been a problem when it comes to multilateral treaties. Largely, again, like these, these treaties get blocked in Congress or reservations are attached to them that in, in effect vitiate them. Uh, but in spite of that, the U.S. more or less follows uh, the, the principles yeah. here. And, and getting hung up on that, I think, would be a mistake for China. I think it should focus on the problem at hand. Yes, and the problem at hand. So um, they are, uh, China is a member of the convention, but, uh, and China is obligated then to arbitrate under that. Very simple. Um, member, you agree to certain things, and one of them is arbitration. But uh, China has not arbitrated. What is their defense for that, you know, that obligation? 
Well, they claim that the, the Philippines uh, is bringing a case that violates or, or, or in effect, denies juris that, that, should, that, that the tribunal should not have jurisdiction for. And they claim this for two reasons. One is uh, that this is really a dispute over who owns the islands, that is sovereignty. And this treaty does not cover uh, territory, island territory. It only covers the sea. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, rights in the sea that attach to land, but at the end of the day, uh, it has nothing to say about who owns the island, who is sovereign. And the other claim they have is they are allowed to put a reservation when they sign on to the treaty uh, that, in effect, says that they do not subject themselves to this dispute mechanism uh, when it, you know, uh, when it comes to questions of delimitation of whose water is what, you know, to whose area is what in the sea. Uh, and, but however, uh, the provision that they signed on to merely talks about uh, when their zones overlap and delimiting overlapping uh, areas in the sea. Uh, and the tribunal took the view uh, in response to these two things that they're both uh, wrong. One is they're not going to decide and did not decide who owns the islands in, in the area. And two, uh, there were no overlapping, uh, uh, what we call exclusive economic zones. So that's all. Uh, and the tribunal, therefore, was not barred from taking jurisdiction. In fact, it was bound to take jurisdiction under the treaty if a member state uh, brought an action. They, they made a kind of a special appearance, though, didn't they? China made an appearance to, um, to contest jurisdiction. And I guess uh, uh, that, that, that runs uh, parallel to some of the procedures we have in the United States. They didn't acknowledge jurisdiction. They only appeared to say that there was no jurisdiction. On yeah, the other hand, they, I think it was a false argument anyway. Yeah, they filed a, 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 some kind of statement about this, but they didn't formally appear in the case. Okay. And so they, they were, uh, uh, and they never did appear. It was actually comparable to the way the U.S. handled the Nicaragua case years ago involving Contra rebels and all this, where the United States was brought before that tribunal in the U.S., uh, said no. There's uh, it appeared actually, and and said that and challenged jurisdiction and lost. It challenged it because the U.S. had a reservation to uh, the the tr relevant treaties that said it would not accept uh, the International Court of Justice's jurisdiction when uh, involving a multilateral treaty. Where the court says, well, this is also customary law that you not you know invade another country, yeah. uh, and so the U.S. lost on that. This is brought up frequently by China because then the U.S. actually uh, didn't appear further and withdrew from the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. So the U.S. is setting a sort of bad example here again. Yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, but, uh, in but on case, China's part, it, it seems to me there's a little disingenuous to be a member um, and then, you know, to contest jurisdiction and then not to appear at all. Uh, wouldn't right. they have been better off, you know, in a substantive basis. I mean, it, it smells like in the very outset they knew they were going to lose this case because they don't have a good claim. Um, but wouldn't it have been better for them to appear and go through the procedure the way everybody else did? I would have thought so. Uh, I, I guess then they wouldn't have the argument that they're going to ignore it and they're attacking this judgment vociferously saying that it's an illegal one, that the tribunal was constituted illegally. One of the problems is that, that uh, if they join the, in the case, then they have a right to so, uh, participate in the selection of the arbitrators, the judges. Uh, by not appearing, they didn't have that right, and so instead that was left to the president of the Law of the Sea Court. And, and this person happens to be Japanese, so that, of course, China has disputes over the sea with Japanese as well. So, but the, the arbitrators he selected seemed very respectable, mostly from Europe, one from Africa, and so it didn't seem like a sweetheart deal at all. It seemed very above board. And when you read the decision, I, my God, the decision goes on for 500 pages. Uh, so when you read it, you can see they were very, very thorough. And, and as I argue in this op-ed, I actually think it would have been to China's, it is still is to China's advantage to use this decision uh, now, they could have shaped it better if they had participated, uh, perhaps. They, their arguments would have been more forceful, or the judges uh, that were selected would have been more sympathetic. But at the end of the day, because uh, now the judges that were selected reached a unanimous decision in this case. Yeah. At the end of the day, I think there's a lot of ways out for China on this, 
Uh, and if they read the judgment carefully, it doesn't seem like they have. Uh, there's, you know, it's really it's not as bad as they make it out to be. Yeah, and your point, which we'll get to in a minute, is that this, that this is a platform for negotiation, that it right. is not a matter of uh, uh, using force or defending against force or um, having a real set to about it. Rather, this is a good start for negotiation. Uh, and that's, I think that's a very good contribution. This article is a valuable contribution in that regard. Yeah, and, I, and it's unfortunate if you read the news today, you know, uh, the, the Philippine uh, foreign minister uh, has, has in effect said that China, in a meeting with the Chinese foreign minister, told him uh, that uh, the only way China would negotiate is if the Philippines agrees to ignore the decision. So instead of using it as a platform, <laughs> they're torpedoing it and saying, we'll only talk to you on that basis. Yeah. The Philippines says, no, if that condition is added, we're not going to talk to you. So that's sort of where it's at. Two, two thoughts about that. One is that I had understood, maybe I, I, I'm not sure where I got this from, but I had understood a long time ago uh, that the, the Chinese had no intention of respecting the decision, whatever it was, unless it was in their favor. Uh, that they anticipated it would not be in their favor, that they didn't have a good claim, um, and that they were not going to abide by it in any event. So this is not news. This is not a, a surprise they take the position now. The other reaction I have is that uh, inherent in the notion in what, in what they said to the Philippines, that they asked the Philippines to disregard the you know, decision just the way they are disregarding a decision, that's, that's inherently a threat, isn't it? Well, yeah, it, it certainly, uh, I think the Philippine leader, he's a new one now, uh, Duterte, uh, just elected. He's sort of uh, got a rather roguish reputation, so people weren't quite sure what he was going to do because the action was brought by his predecessor. Uh, and he's, some people call him the Donald Trump of <laughs> the Philippines, the guy that's elected. One's enough, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a loose cannon. Uh, and so uh, the result is, uh, you know, people didn't quite know whether he would stand his ground, but I think the, the popular sentiment in the Philippines is that he should. So he disregards this judgment at his political peril. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get back to all those points, and uh, before we take our break, um, I, I would like to, um, you know, ask you, what, what is the reaction in Hong Kong? What is the reaction in Asia in general? And to the extent that you can see it from there, what is the reaction in, in the U.S. and Europe to this decision yeah. and to the, uh, the, the refusal of China to abide by it? Well, I think the reaction is very positive to the decision because, you know, there's an old principle in law that uh, maybe no matter who wins a particular thing, just having clarity as to, you know, principles that apply uh, can be to everyone's advantage, sort of the spirit of the op-ed that, that you're, you've read. Uh, and, and I think generally everyone around the world uh, has viewed China's claims to the long stretches of the South China Sea along all of its neighbors uh, to be excessive, uh, and it's kind of bullying its way in, into these claims. And so to have them sort of slammed, uh, I think, was generally viewed favorably by most people here in Hong Kong was a bit of a split because we had what we call the pro-Beijing camp and the, you know, more pro-pan-democratic camp. Uh, Pan-democrats, I don't think, are much interested or care, but the pro-Beijing guys are all trying to give their testimonials to support the regime. So uh, that's sort of what happens politically here. And an interesting move was Taiwan, the new leader in Taiwan has also attacked the judgment because she thinks it uh, takes away Taiwan's, or purports to take away Taiwan's sovereignty uh, over uh, Taiping Island, which is in the Spratlys. And it doesn't do that. I mean, it limits the, it says in effect that island is a rock, and thus it does not have an exclusive economic zone, but it does have territorial waters, and the court never decides who owns it. So. It really didn't do as much harm to Taiwan's claim as Taiwan would think. Well, but do you think that Taiwan is just uh, uh, accommodating the Chinese point on this for political purposes? It's hard to know because she's, of course, the DPP party, which is the one the party that doesn't get along with China. Mm. And so, you know, the woman Dong party uh, just stepped down, and so she's taken Miss Tsai has taken up office, and China has cut off all communications with her. So there's a very a testy relationship going on, uh, but they like what she did here. 
Uh, but at the same time, her base may not like it so much that she's yeah. getting close to China. So, you know, all of these things have a domestic component and an external component. Let's take a short break, Michael. Uh, it's Michael Davis, uh, University of Hong Kong, professor of international law. We're talking here on Think Tech Asia about damage control in the South China Sea. We'll be right back. Welcome to thinktechhawaii.com. This is Johnson Choi, your host. My focus is Asia in Reveal. We talk about interesting subjects in Asia. Be sure to check the thinktech.com website on the next topic. Thank you. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, meeting people we may have not otherwise met, helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman. I represent the Pune and Ka'u District on the Big Island and the host of Ruderman Roundtable. We're here on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. You can join us at thinktechhawaii.com. You can find a link there to, uh, to a page where you can see past episodes. And we talk here about good government, environmental issues, and issues of the day facing the state of Hawaii. I'm Russell Ruderman. Please join us for the Ruderman Roundtable. Mahalo. We're back. We're live. We're here with Michael Davis. Joins us by Skype from Hong Kong. Uh, he's a professor of international law at the University of Hong Kong here on Think Tech Asia. And we're talking about damage control in the South China Sea. And we're uh, operating off an article that he wrote in, in the inside section of the South, uh, South China Morning Post. Um, so, <clears throat> so let's talk about some of those uh, other points you made uh, in the article. You talked about sovereignty. You touched on that before the break. So the, the Hague does not deal with questions of sovereignty. Uh, what, what exactly is its jurisdiction based on here, anyway? Yeah, it's based on the UN Treaty. And the UN Treaty itself, the UN Treaty on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, <clears throat> does not uh, address the question of sovereignty over these islands uh, along the sea or any, any sovereign territorial issues. Uh, that's not a subject of treaty. If someone wants to go to a tribunal for that, they would have to either set up a separate arbitration or go to the International Court of Justice to argue over who owns an island. And so one of the objections of China, and one the court uh, accepts, is that it didn't have uh, sovereignty to, to decide that. And, and so, but it did take the view that it had the power under the treaty to decide uh, what were islands and what were not. And if something is an island, that is, it's not submerged during high tide. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, it sticks above the, the water at high tide. Then uh, it is, it could have uh, territorial waters. Uh, and so uh, it did conclude that in Scarborough and in the Spratlys, there were islands. Now, among the islands, there's, a, there's an article in the treaty that says that if an island is not uh, subject to human habitation, that you know, it's not fit for human habitation. I, the words are in in the, the article there, but something of this nature. Then uh, it uh, is classified as a rock. If it's a rock, then it only has the territorial sea, which is the 12 miles. It doesn't have the other zones, the exclusive economic zone or a continental shelf. What the what the tribunal held was that all of these islands in the Spratlys, you know, these little rocks sticking up are all rocks. And in effect, none of them have these 200 mile exclusive economic zones. And that has a big implication for the resources and stuff there. That means that whoever owns the island only controls out to 12 nautical miles and not 200 from, from the baseline of the island. So, so that was a critical part of the decision. It seems like a massive point, but I personally am, am a bit skeptical about how big it is. I think it's important to appreciate that these countries, all of them, have domestic political problems if they surrender territory, they surrender sovereignty over something. But from the average Joe's point of view, it's the island that, that you have to hold on to, not all the seas around it. Uh, the people in Japan, the right, will get incensed if, if Abe gives up uh, you know, islands. They're not going to fuss over whether he gave up some column of water somewhere, uh, but they're going to get mad if he does that. And Xi Jinping has the same limitations, and so does uh, Duterte in the Philippines. They all have to guard their, and, and Tsai in Taiwan. 
they ought to guard their islands. So the fact that these islands' sovereignty has not been decided, uh, I don't think is, a, is an obstacle that should hang China up that much. Because yeah. at the end of the day, if China wants the resources in the area, companies are going to be given contracts and they're going to get these resources. And it may not matter that much which country is giving them the contract because the resources are here in the region, they're going to be available and they're going to be purchased. Yeah. So uh, it becomes, uh, I think uh, China maybe is not considering this carefully enough. There's been no, these so-called islands that have been designated rocks without 200 mile zones yeah. are still up for grabs. And, and if they can win them in any way by negotiated settlement or by a tribunal of some nature, then that's still there. Nothing has changed in that regard. Yeah. Well, what about Scarborough? Scarborough is uh, not a rock. Scarborough is, um, you know, a military base already, uh, and Scarborough was an important strategical uh, feature in that area already. Um, wh wh where does where does the decision take take on that well, one? The thing that's important here is Scarborough, of course, is called Scarborough Shoal. And so, in a sense, if you and I were seeing its name, we would think it's all underwater uh, during high tide. But what was interesting, and, and, and a lot of the media kind of got confused on this was interesting is the court did say some parts stuck up above water at high tide. So some of it is islands and that means a 12 mile nautical mile zone around it is still up for grabs even though it's physically <coughs> located in the Philippines exclusive economic zone. <laughs> so Scarborough does have islands but you're talking about <coughs> buildings and stuff, artificial islands. The court does not consider artificial islands. They consider it only in the natural condition. So ah. the court, if you read the decision of going on for so many pages, it actually looks at the history of what it looked like before people started trying building things around there. Yeah. And so, and that's true of all the islands where there have been built structures. There are two of them that, that in effect were handed to the Philippines. That was the appropriately named Mischief Reef, Mischief which China Reef. has <laughs> built some artificial stuff on top of. That's clearly in the Philippines area and in its natural condition never did extend above high tide. So that one and the so-called second Thomas Shoal nearby were in effect awarded to the Philippines because they're both deemed to be below uh, high tide uh, elevation. Well, you say awarded, and but um, it, you know, yeah, question is, is, is that going to stick? Is China going to disregard that too? Well, it is. It's claiming to disregard everything. Yeah. Uh, I think their case for doing that is kind of slim. In effect, those are no different than the seabed, and they're very clearly inside the 200 nautical miles from Palawan Island in the Philippines. So the result is, uh, if China wants to claim them, it's trying to intrude. What China's argument essentially was, though, is the Spratlys is within 200 miles as well. So if the Spratly Island, Taiping, were not deemed to be uh, just a rock, then it would have 200 miles and you would have overlapping exclusive economic zones. But that didn't happen because, that, so the court dodged all of that. In the original uh, motion to dismiss the case over jurisdiction, the court had said it would not even decide those issues until the facts were explored uh -huh. because it needed to determine whether that was a rock or an island. Yeah, By the yeah. way, rock doesn't mean it's physically made of rock. It just means an island not fit for human habitation. Yeah. Uh, and usually that, that if there's never been human habitation except for, uh, you know, contrived human habitation, then, then it's likely it's not fit. Well, let, let's uh, address the, uh, the one that really offends most people, and that is uh, China's claim that it has some sort of co inco inchoate historical right to this area uh, based on something that, what was it, the nine dotted line uh, back when, which has no legal moment at all. But that's, that's been the, their primary um, position, hasn't it? That they have an historical right? That's what they tell you, no? Yeah? Right, yeah. And that, that was also part of the judgment. <clears throat> because this is kind of never, it's never been clear just what is the basis for this historical right. Uh, you know, there is a, a provision within the treaty that says that there are these established historical uh, claims uh, that they could be considered uh, but the, I can say generally these tribunals take a dim view of it because countries in those days, uh, when it comes to uninhabited islands, really didn't care about them. They were just useless because you couldn't, in, you know, take the 
oil or whatever from the bottom of the sea, you know, in the 19th century. So the islands weren't really valued much. So countries that try to make the, out these historical claims typically rely on the fact that fishermen stopped there and so on. And tribunals, in, and this one included, don't take much, they take a dim view of that. That, yeah. you know, that's not really a sovereignty claim. China even claims on some islands in the East China Sea that they sailed past them on their way to Okinawa. Uh, <laughs> this is not a basis for sovereignty. And so uh, it's generally thought, even before this, that these so-called nine dash lines, which were actually 11 originally, and they were written by Taiwan, the Republic of China, uh, would not be taken very seriously. And China's never really told the world what's the basis of those claims. Yeah, yeah. And in this hearing, uh, when the court, in this judgment, where the court goes on for 500 pages, it has a number of pages where it discusses the inadequacy of, of uh, any claim based on this and, and argues that China has accepted the treaty. So, you know, the treaty is coherent, yeah. but some kind of vague historical claim is not. Yeah. And that was dismissed. Now, what, what about this, uh, these last couple of points you made in your article uh, uh, in the South China Morning Post? Um, that is, uh, that there's been environmental damage, and the court recognized that, uh, and that China has been uh, trying to shoo away its patrol boats that have been trying to shoo away Filipino uh, fishermen. Uh, where does that fit, fit in the decision? Well, this is really important because one thing people may not appreciate, there's over 300 articles <clears throat> in this UN Law of the Sea Treaty, and many of the articles deal with issues such as these. Uh, and uh, so it, it's, it's an important part of the treaty to preserve the natural environment of, of the seas. Uh, and China, <clears throat> has, you know, in Hawaii, I remember <clears throat> when I go to Hanuma Bay, I'm told I'm not supposed to step on the reef, and they have these lovely little movies telling us all about the reef. <clears throat> well, over here in the South, South China Sea, the Chinese have been blasting away at the reef, you know, to build these artificial islands. And, and I thought, well, that's bad enough, you know, and it, 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 we're told that 60% of a reef is destroyed when they go about doing this. Uh, and of course, all the muck and mud and everything and sand that's stirred up may kill the reefs even further. People in Hawaii know this. Uh, but then it turns out when they want to get clams and sea turtles from underneath uh, areas of the reef, they actually have figured out the fishermen, and it's not the government, but the government is somewhat responsible for what they do, uh, have figured out that they can use boat propellers to sort of oh, drill. Oh, yeah, I saw that in your article. I was really dismayed about that. Well, yeah. you know, all the equities really favor the Philippine claim here. And so mm -hmm. I think it's a great statement um, that the Hague is alive and well, the tribunal is alive and well, the law of the sea is alive and well, except for China's refusal to abide by it. And I, and I think, uh, Michael, your point, your suggestion, that this is a good point, a platform, a starting off point uh, for a good negotiation, that would be the only realistic solution here. And I sure hope we reach that. I, I sure hope that you continue to write and speak for that. We're out of time, but I want to thank you for uh, coming around um, and talking about the South China Sea and the damage control. Thank you for sending the article. Um, this is an amazing issue. We'll be covering it some more in the future. Thank you, Michael Davis. Uh, professor of International Law at the University of Hong Kong. Thank you, Jay. Look forward to future discussions. Take care.